They all watch it. You see it? I'm performing a mirror. You don't see it. How about now? I want to talk to you about balance. Sense of balance is miraculous. Sense of balance is different from all our other senses. <clears throat> Each of our other senses has only a single input. You see with your eyes, you smell with your nose, hear with your ears. But balance is different. Balance gets information from all over the place. There are five balance organs in each ear that read my head movements in different directions. Plus my vision is telling me where I am in space. And the feeling in my muscles and my joints coming up the spine is sending information about alignment and position and movement. All that information converges in the balanced part of my brain where it's integrated in a precise way. It gives me a sense of spatial orientation, balance. And then the brain does some other processing and it sends messages back out. Some of those messages go to my eyes so that my gaze is stable while my head is moving. I can drive on a bumpy road and still read a street sign. And some of those signals go back down to my legs so I can stand and walk and dance. And if there's a problem anywhere in that system, the sensory inputs, the central processing, or the muscle outputs, something is wrong with my balance. Now, we learn to balance as infants and toddlers. And although it's a different part of the brain, <clears throat> there's a pretty good analogy to learning language. In the case of balance, we're taking those ear inputs and eye inputs and muscle inputs and learning how to coordinate them. When my left ear says this and my right ear says that, I'm turning left, I'm turning right, looking up or down. If I turn my head to the left, my ear reads that rotation, but at the same time my eyes see the world sweep by and my neck muscles feel the contractions and relaxations. All those sensory inputs are in alignment, they're in agreement. But what if they're not? If I'm below deck in a ship, I'm sitting in my cabin, the cabin looks perfectly still, but my ear is reading the rolling motion of the ship, my muscles are reading the rolling motion of the ship, my eyes say I'm still, other parts of me say I'm not, pretty soon I don't feel good. <laughs> and if you have a kid who's car sick and you put him in the back of the car with a book or a tablet, the book says the world is still, but the ear says the world is not, and pretty soon they don't feel so good. If you're motion sick, if you're seasick prone, you know that when you go up on deck, your ear still reads the rolling deck, your muscles read the rolling deck, but now your vision confirms and sees the rolling horizon, and you've reestablished harmony, you've eliminated the sensory conflict and resolve the source of that dis-ease. Well, sometimes sensory conflict is permanent. It's not so easily removed as going up on deck or moving to the front seat of the car. If I have trauma and damage in ear, if I have an infection, toxic drug exposure, I may cause permanent damage. And now when my left ear says this and my right ear says that, I'm not turning left, I'm doing something else. And the brain has to relearn all of those things that it did when I was a toddler. It's like learning a second language. And just like learning a second language, a child could do this in a couple of weeks, but it might take me months and months. Learning a second language is hard work, it takes concentration, it's effortful, and so it's exhausting. If I go to another country, and in a day I can ask where's the restroom or can I have coffee and a pastry, but if somebody wants to talk to me about plumbing repairs or economic policy, it's months before I could begin to hold that conversation. And we see the same phenomenon in our dizzy patients. After a, a permanent change in the balance system, the 
gradual process of relearning how to understand the signals and how to reintegrate them with the muscles and the eyes takes weeks and months and great effort. And it may never feel quite as effortless and natural as speaking in their native language. Patients who have balance problems have a, another challenge. In our healthcare system, we chop up the body by organ system. And we chop it up more into medical and surgical components. We have cardiac surgeons and cardiologists. We have neurosurgeons and neurologists. And so, now you know the balance system has no respect for the boundaries of medical specialties. It's a distributed system. It's all through us. And so there's no one specialist who owns the system. And so for a patient, this is a lot like the story of the blind men and the elephant. And I'm sure you've heard it of a village with six blind men and there was a great commotion in the center of the village because a stranger had come into town leading a great beast. And so the Blind men hurried to the center of the village and they gathered round the beast. And one man grabbed the tail and said, it's like a piece of rope. And another grabbed the trunk and said, it's like a great snake. Someone held the leg and said it felt like a tree trunk. The flank felt like a wall, the ear like a carpet, and the tusk like a spear. And none of them could agree on the nature of the beast standing before them. And as docs who take care of dizzy patients and dizzy patients themselves, this is a constant battle. These patients are not well served by our healthcare system. We collected some information in my office a few years ago on 200 consecutive patients coming to see me for their chronic dizziness. And on average, they'd been symptomatic for three years and had seen nine other doctors before they were coming to see me. Now, I'm an ear doc. I try to see the whole beast, but admit that I may have blind spots. I spend three days a week in clinic all day, and not a day goes by that I don't encounter a story like this one. This is Mrs. Kelly, who's 83, delightful patient. And when I walked in to meet her, she was sitting in the examining chair. Her husband was there. Three of her five adult children were there. And they came with a story that mom uh, was dizzy. And as we discussed what they meant by that, the story unfolded that over the last year or two, Mrs. Kelly has been becoming more and more rickety on her feet. She began to have a little trouble stepping off the curb or getting in and out of the car. She was slower going up and down the stairs. She was becoming more timid. She clutched her husband's arm when they'd be out walking because she had a, a fear of falling. And then about a year ago, she actually did fall and got banged up badly. She got a black eye and broke her glasses, and her anxiety level went way up. And so she discussed that with her primary care doctor who put her on medication for anxiety, which made her just a little groggy. She's more fearful about going out of the house. She's a little groggy. She spends more time sitting around, so she's lost some of her energy. She happens to also be on a medication for sleep a medication for post-nasal drip. She had a hip replacement about three years ago and hasn't had the other one done yet. She had a cataract done on one side, hasn't had the other one done yet. I look down at her feet and she's wearing a pair of squishy running shoes, three sizes too big because she has bunions and her feet hurt. So this is not a problem of sensory conflict and learning new languages. This is a condition we call progressive disequilibrium of aging. And it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of all the parts of this woman's balance system in decline. Her ears are 83 years old and just as they may not hear as well as they once did, they don't send as much balance information. Her vision is a little goofy because she's had one eye fixed and one eye not. She's wearing squishy shoes so she doesn't even really feel the floor. She walks on sponges all day. She's got a titanium hip, it doesn't tell her anything. And when these 
signals, this reduced data set of information arrives in her brain. It's a groggy brain. It's an 83-year-old brain to begin with. And then we sedated it with a sleeping medicine and an anxiety medicine and an antihistamine. And often the patient has complained of dizziness, so they've been given some meclizine, which is a medication used inappropriately in most cases for dizziness. And she's kind of a zombie. She sits in her chair all day and just has no energy. And if she does get up, she's deconditioned. She's weak and she's stiff. And she has a good reason to be fearful about falling. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Because as people age, their balance declines. Dizziness is one of the top three chief complaints of all primary care office visits. And people who get dizzy fall. Here in the United States, we spend about $50 billion a year on health care of people who fall, the primary injury and subsequent injuries. And here's, for me, maybe the scariest statistic of all. In seniors who fall and break a hip, 20% of them are dead in a year, and 50% are dead in two years. People who age get dizzy, people who get dizzy fall, people who fall and get hurt die. Uh-oh. Well, the good news is that there's actually a lot I can offer to Mrs. Kelly and her family. The low-hanging fruit, we can send her to the eye doctor and get her vision tuned up. We can send her to the podiatrist, get her feet taken care of. We can speak with her primary care doc about pruning her medication list down to the things that she really needs and get rid of the sedating medications unless she absolutely needs them. We can send her to the physical therapist for some training and coaching about falls risk management, some conditioning of strength and flexibility, gait training to decide if she needs a cane or a cane with little feet or even a rollator. We want her up and about, but in a safe way. And we could talk about making her home a safe environment. She needs to have night lights so she doesn't bump around in the dark. The stairs need handrails that support her body weight. She needs safety grab bars by the tub and toilet, non-slip surfaces anywhere that gets wet, and to get rid of extension cords and little area rugs, low furniture, anything that might cause her to trip. Because if she trips, she is going down. And if she goes down, she may really get hurt. Now when I present this to the family, they totally get it. They understand that mom is not going to be a star on the tennis court. But here are some concrete things that they can do. They can take these home and they can make the environment safe. They can improve her quality of life. They can preserve her safety and her independence. And they have a mission. Now, as I'm telling you that story about 83-year-old <coughs> Mrs. Kelly, some of you may be old enough to really be able to relate to it firsthand. Many of you may have <coughs> aging parents, and you've seen this play out around you. But I'm not just talking about people who are 80 years old. I'm, I'm talking about you. I'm talking to all of you because all of us, as we age, will have decline in our balance. Every one of us. And there is no question that balance is a use it or lose it proposition. Everything we do to maintain our alertness and our awareness, our fitness and mobility is slowing the trajectory of that decline. And you don't want to wait till you're 83 years old and fearful to do something about it. You want to do something about it now. You use it or lose it. The balance system is miraculous. To take all of that diverse sensory information and weave it together to give us spatial orientation and stability and mobility, you use it or you lose it. Now certainly you can take care of your vision and you can trim your medication list and Consider what you wear on your feet. You could think about your weight. A human is an inverted pendulum. I'm stuck at the bottom and I sway at the top. 
and I have a cone of stability. And as long as I'm inside that cone, everything's great. But if I go outside the cone, I'm going down, unless I have the agility to take that step. If you carry less weight, if you have more flexibility and agility, you're safer. Use it or lose it. You can stand on one foot when you brush your teeth in the morning. You can stand on the other foot when you brush your teeth in the evening. You can use the stairs instead of the elevator. When you go to the mall, instead of driving around and around looking for the closest parking space, park on the far side of the lot and walk. When you get into the grocery store, carry the handbasket instead of hanging on a rolling cart. Use it or lose it. Walk. Walk to work, walk to school, just take a walk for the joy of it. You can hike, you can jog, you can run, you can cycle. You can be sociable, take a class, take a Tai Chi class or Pilates or yoga, take a dance class, just go dancing. Use your balance. Evolution has made a, an incredible investment in us developing this robust, this miraculous sense of balance that lets us stand and move with precision and fluidity and you use it or you lose it. So go use your balance. Promise me you will go out and use your balance and perform some miracles of your own. Thank <laughs> you.